this is welcome to um, ACE Dog Sports Pay If You Can Learning. Um, pay if you watch it on YouTube recording or don't. And I always start with um, screen sharing. I'm going to uh, remind everybody to turn off their mics. Jen, I think you're the only one. Um, and I'm going to screen share and go right to the reminders of what we're doing and why we're doing it. So this was course maps. I think we're still advertising course maps. Um, but it's really course dissection. And each week it, it evolves a little bit more into handling and um, strategies. And um, so different courses promote me to talk about different things, whether it's training, handling, or competition. Um, I have three phases of making a plan. That's the plan for how I'm going to handle the course. And it's the making of the plan. There's lots of things that are relevant. One of the main things is the geometry of the course. And um, no matter how many times I say this, doing it, really, really doing it, the way I mean it um, isn't easy for lots of my students. I want you guys, when you're looking at a course, to like take a pencil and try to draw a pretty flowy picture from one obstacle to the other. Like it's not even about dogs and people. Like it's just about, oh, if I, I could go this way or I could go that way. Like maybe it's a maze or some type of word puzzle. And there's a prize to see um, how many different paths you can draw and still stay on course. Make it about pencil, lead and ink. So um, because if you're trying to figure out what you can do, what your training skills are, all the stuff that you have to figure out after this part, if you try to do all that during this part, your brain isn't going to let you see the course for just the course. So when I think of basic geometry, I think of that pencil line and um, taking a jump in a way that would, when the dog lands, he'd be in the path for the next thing. So I'm noticing, oh, there's a turn. Oh, the dog just goes straight. Oh, the dog comes from this one and where he lands, I'll put him perfectly in line for that other one, but then he's gonna be lined up for the wrong one. So that's my basic geometry. When the dog, and a lot of times when we look at a course, we think the dog is gonna magically be in the middle of the two stanchions. Our brain does that until we learn that the dog is actually jumping the bar on the angle from the direction that he's coming on. So maybe I'll draw that when I'm done talking. And then there's the advanced geometry where the dog is gonna take the jump and then come back to the takeoff side, either via around the back side. Um, that's not true. The back side would be the refusal line to the bar. So he's coming He's wrapping the stanchion towards you and he's coming back over the bar, around, going around the backside. And then the other way, he's, it's a classic wrap. He's taking the bar to the refusal line. I call that advanced geometry because we don't know which wing the dog, the, you have a choice. You get to pick which way you go. So tonight's lecture, and it's going to be a lecture. <laughs> this isn't going to be a guess. This is going to be a lecture is on that. And then phase two is all these decisions. What side of you, your left or your right, is it to your advantage to have your dog in the obstacle line? Um, the skills, like how well, like Quilly Bear, my little, my little darling world champion, light of my life, she got scared on a teeter at a national event, really scared, like it hit her hard. Um, so those of you that if you're ever 
asked to drop a dollar in a hat to buy a school or a equipment provider a new teeter and you have a big dog and you don't see what the big deal is um it's it's for quilly bear um put a dollar in the hat we got to get the highest quality equipment in every facility there's my soapbox for every dog um so anyways i had to stay by the teeters forever I couldn't fix it. I couldn't get her comfortable enough to be okay. She said, okay, I'm going to cut a deal with you, mama. She was older, eight or nine. And um, I got her back on the teeter. I got a great performance, but she was said, we cut a deal. She said, I'm not doing it without you close to me. And um, at her age, it wasn't, if she had been three, I would have taken the time, but I couldn't if she had been three years old, I would have taken the time that it took for her to be okay, but it would have taken longer than I was willing to pay. So I cut the deal that I would stay by her. And those are the types of things that I love to talk about with my students, but sometimes they wanna cut deals with the dogs too soon in the dog's career or for the wrong reasons. So deals can be made, um, but you just wanna talk it through with somebody. The lanes, the paralleling, the converging, the peel away, which lane you're going to be in. Are you going to be driving on a country road where you're in the lane right next to the dog slash car? Or are you in Los Angeles where there's lots of lanes to travel in? Those, those are the types of decisions that make up phase two, the nitty gritty. And then phase three is planning that precision walkthrough. So um, I used to call these just the three phases of the walkthrough, but it's really bigger than that and encompasses more. So some of the people in this call, on this Zoom call, are um, compete with me on the weekends. And if I were them, I would say, Sandy, I've noticed lately that you don't seem to be not that anybody's watching me on a walkthrough, but um, five full minutes is my goal for my dress rehearsal from start to finish. We get eight minutes to walk a course. Sometimes we get more if the course is just, if there's a one jump trial, they'll have a course open and you can be out there and obsess. I'll just throw you a, a tidbit about obsessing on a course. If you're just out there walking for the sake of it and you are not laser focused, don't be out there. So I'll start to leave early and then I'll like, oh, I don't wanna leave early. I like to milk that sucker, but I have to go into laser focus. That means if my arm is up, I know how much it's up. If I'm extending, I can feel muscles. Because if I'm out there just droning around, half paying attention to the poles as I'm walking by, I'm kind of lackadaisical. I'm just too worried this old brain and old body aren't going to see eye to eye when um, the shit hits the fan when I'm out there with my dog. And um, I need to have um, focus, intensity, precision, um, helping my dog as much as I possibly can. So I want to do that for full five minutes. So I really want to get those decisions out of the way in three minutes. And lately, I haven't been studying my courses enough before I get out there. And I'm spending a little bit of time of those precious eight minutes learning the course. And um, it is not smart. It's not a smart way to go. Do I still have great runs sometimes? Do I blame every bad run on that? I'm pretty good at knowing why a, a run went wrong, but I have to suspect if I didn't do, if I didn't make the goal of doing all this stuff, then I have to suspect that it influenced. I believe things matter. I believe we can influence our runs. Um, I also believe we can't be perfect all the time or even close. Two questions to ask yourself after your run. Did you create a good plan? Did you execute the plan as you planned? So I can usually tell immediately if I goofed on the plan or if I goofed on the execution. I can also have a pretty good judge about if the 
good plan was based on my strengths or it was the best plan for stuff I'm not really aren't my you know my signature moves I like to call them and then um, did I execute did I end up where I said I was gonna did I handle it just as I intended and these are objective um, scenario I mean these are these things I try to look at it from a I'm not trying to make myself feel good. I'm not trying to make myself feel bad. I'm trying to be a scientist. I'm trying to gather useful facts that will serve me well in the future um, for making decisions for plans and execution. I want to know what I need to work on. Thank you for coming. I've put my um, email here. If you want to tell me something about your experience or if you're watching this um, pre-recorded, if you want to make a comment, um, I, I'm always asking people that are here that know me if they want more detail or less detail. And I'm hearing mostly they, the detail is enjoyed. Um, so um, I'll keep doing what I'm doing until I'm prompted differently. We do have a great YouTube channel where these recordings live and um, Sandy Rogers and Ace Dog Sports are on Facebook and the Instagram um, is there. <laughs> Tell a friend. Um, and at this stage of the game, I'm gonna turn on Elmo and get rid of the slides. Here is the course that we're gonna be um, looking at if anybody wants to take a photo or whatever, but it'll also be on the other um, screen. It just takes Elmo a few minutes. Hmm. There he is. It takes a minute. Or a couple of seconds. Okay, can you see the paper? Hello? Yep, we can. Thank you. So I want to talk I really want to talk about 180s, but first I'm going to talk about pinwheels. And we've talked about pinwheels a bit. Um, when you're practicing pinwheels, and you're going to change direction. You're in the middle. So maybe you're standing in the middle directing the dog around. Maybe you're moving in different lanes. So I would call we could call the big circle a dog's lane and then you could have any of these lanes. So you could be standing right in the middle too. And then you want to change direction. So just here's a handling tip. When I change direction on a pinwheel, I don't pass the jump. So most people, and I used to as well, if you were going to change and go the other way, your dog would be going around clockwise. And when he got to say this jump, you would turn him this way and you would go back that way. Can you see how tight that is? And then the dog is then taking this jump really like that. This little adjustment I just did, that's the non-reality thing. Now, a handler could put their body here and travel with the dog and wrap their dog around them and waste the yardage. But really the dog is, is probably gonna go like this. Sorry guys, I'm drawing a lot of lines here. So the dog is taking the bar like that. Or with the handler in the middle, if you've taught your dog a turn away cue, now the dog is approaching that jump at a much nicer angle. So when I'm changing directions on a pinwheel, I turn the dog to the outside. I don't turn them to the inside. 
So I hope that, um, so, and, and I practice left and right, and you can actually go in there and do rears or hook or turn, however you do it. So when I'm talking about advanced geometry, the pinwheel, well, we can go, this is an odd, this is an odd angled one, but it's still a pinwheel, is a great way to see it because you can see if this jump was one and this jump was two and this jump was three and this jump was four, that if we went over the jump and brought the dog the easy way, because you're on this side, that you're shooting the dog out here and then you're gonna yank them back to there. Whereas if you told your dog to go from one to two, that's a straight line, and turned them to the outside. I wanna make this really clear. When you're taking two to three, that is a nice line. When you're taking two to three this direction, that is also a nice line. It can't be three. It, you cannot judge which way to go on two because of three. You need four to tell you that when your dog takes this bar like this, it's easier to go this way than if he takes the bar like that. This arrow, even though it's not pointing directly at four, is pointing more at four than this arrow. That's it, that's the whole enchilada. That's the whole, that's the whole thing about the advanced geometry. All right, now we're gonna talk about the dog show. So you guys, I often, let me think a minute how I wanna say this. I can remember when I first learned about the, we always handled, I've been doing this a long time. We always handled really the easiest way. We didn't, I didn't, and I don't remember anybody else talking much about this line and path thing, the easier path for the dog. And, and if it was super hard, I mean, we wouldn't, I can remember saying to other handles, why the heck? like on this pinwheel, why would you ever do something so hard? It's so much easier to just turn the dog the other way. And um, it's just so much easier, so much easier. And I remember a friend saying, it's the line, it sets a better line. Now, every time I walk a course, I get to discover the lines, I get to draw them. And um, find a way to handle them. And I'm pretty set on doing the best line for the dog. I kind of feel obligated. I also train a lot. So the, like I tell my students, if you're not going to go, you may have a reason to not go the best way, but you need um, to know what the reason is. And, and let's have it be valid. So one to two is not a problem and two to three looks fun. Everybody's happy. So now we are going from the tunnel to four and here we have our first um, geometry. So again, you could get from four to five, fine. And you could go around the other wing and get from four to five, fine as well. One takes the dog over the jump that way and one takes the dog over the jump that way. Now, I often can see what folks are doing. Um, and, then, and then in this case, the dog is coming back to, so, you guys, these lines that kind of turn into um, to Z's, um, it's like dominoes. If you if you lose it, it 
it, it gets a little tricky. And this jump is 20 feet apart and this jump is 15 apart. And when you look, well, 18, 19, when you watch the video, I hope that you can see that this seemed way bigger. <laughs> But you can tell, I mean, from this jump to this jump, I've been gardening and I do mulberries every day. That's why my hands look like that. I feel like I need to point that out. I mean, this is pretty much clear across the course, right? This is 80, uh, 40, 90 feet. So, you know, that's, it, it was a hike, this little stretch of jumps here. Normally, there will be uh, people handling this jump this way and people handling this jump this way. Now, I did not watch every single person that walked the course, but I watched a lot and I watched specifically because I do not get put into the position that I was in very often. And that was no one <laughs> is walking this the way I'm walking it. And that it makes a girl a little nervous. I mean, usually there's, you know, 25% of the people have decided to handle it a different way when there's a clear choice like this, no matter what the reason is. And I'm watching different jump heights as well. So um, the majority of the um, people were walking this. And my little arrows may not be looking very different to you, but because this dog, the dog has to come back here, I just felt the dog needed all the help that they could get to do that. And this turn wasn't hard. So now I'm going, what am I missing? They're all seeing something that I'm not because it was actually harder to make sure the dog went into the tunnel and get over here. Some people, and I wanna talk about the different ways to handle this opening because there were lots of really creative, fun things done. And it, and they may have gone this way because of, of not want, of if you had a tiny dog rear crossing this, um, being on this side of the world could have put you off. And there's people here that may, may maybe might wanna share here in a minute. Um, so I started looking closer and closer and closer at it. And I thought, oh, well, if I go this way, where am I actually going to rear cross? Am I going to rear cross here or here? And I don't really like, I, did, I don't like running around courses. So I knew I wouldn't go up here. And if I decelled a little too much here, my dog could actually think I was going in the tunnel. And I was a little bit afraid to blind cross here to get my dog on this side because I thought I might. And again, this looks closer. And that seemed, this looks farther away on the map. That seemed closer in the walkthrough. So you guys, I just had my cake and ate it too. I moved at a time that took the tunnel out of play. And I yelled, I used some real strong goes and I created very subtle rear crosses because there weren't a lot of other things for him to look at. So I decided these, are, I like the jumps to be closer if I'm rear crossing, but I just green lighted him with my voice, which is something we do well. And I did get um, a much better line there and we'll look at the video. Let's talk about, um, the lead out a little bit. I, I, it took me a few, you know, at first I was going to lead because this was an easy send because you could be here and put a little pressure on that and there's no turn to, to cue here. So um, I was going to lead out to about here so that I could be closer to four when the dog came out of the tunnel for two reasons, to show the dog the next obstacle and to get a tight turn. In general, the closer you are to the obstacle, the more influence you have over the dog and the obstacle, the dog at the obstacle. Um, but then once I realized I wanted to go this way, I knew if I was hung, hanging out here, I'm gonna be too far behind to make all this happen and I might have that tunnel in place. So then I knew that I wanted to handle number four 
from about here. That would be ideal for handling four to get some movement going here and um, through here and through here. But that was perfect for this too. So I, I, I was happy. I got to have my cake and eat it too. And I let out to about there. Some folks just let out to here and did this gorgeous, you know, go on, go on tunnel. And then they surped this number four. Lots of people just let out to here and put a little bit of movement into that tunnel. And then they were right here to do a nice double front cross. And then they handled these two on their left and reared that. And I think that that was the real incentive to be on this side was that handling these two jumps on the left and then rearing here and handling these two on the right and then having your dog walk on the right was really the safest thing to do for those two jumps. Unless you had all those little yeah buts that I had. Um, and then the no risk of the off course. You'll see when Tux gets to the end of the dog walk that he's staring right at that tunnel. And had I not released on a Tux, he would have gone in there. If I had given him his generic word, he wants the closest tunnel end this end was the closest. So I'm always aware. So I had planned to be over here to, to say to him, listen, if I'm over here, I would, so here's something I would have avoided. I would have avoided doing the turn on eight and then running to, this is the handicap if you don't have a trained dog walk. This is, this is the price you pay because as you're running to the end of the dog walk to help the dog, you're setting the line to that end of the tunnel. Now, maybe you're faster and you could get in there and do a front cross and that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about when my dogs are getting on an A-frame or a dog walk, what I'm doing with that path. And one of these days I'll tell you how I learned that at Worlds in a bad way. Um, that how early a dog can be influenced for better or worse, richer or poorer with a, with a, with a lane um, and whether it's a good thing or not. And, and sometimes you guys, we'd have to do things like if I had to say, I had to do a front cross here to get to maybe this jump would be closer and we're going this way. Maybe I had to converge then I would be careful with how I released him because I would be saying to my dog, listen, I know all that converging I just did on the dog walk was telling you to go there and it is not going to happen. So I was where I wanted to be. I was surprised he was looking at the tunnel as hard as he was. You'll hear me yell. And um, I said tux, which does mean don't take what you're looking at and uh, got this just fine. And then same thing here, the dog is facing, so this is your course, the dog is facing this jump and I ran here. So this is a beautiful line, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. But the dog has to know what you want when he's right here. So my feet were paralleling that path and I released on here, not okay. And this line was quite nice. And then it was easy to get on this side. And this jump here, because of the amount of speed, I mean, this was a decent um, amount of, of space here. This jump was close. So several dogs took this jump after the teeter. And you'll hear me because this jump, <laughs> I swear it was over here. I swear it was over here. But but I got my line set and I had him taking this this bar nicely, but he still looked at that jump. But I was concerned about it. So I had my eyes on it. You know how people will say somebody, whenever somebody asks me, weren't you afraid of? Weren't you afraid of? Weren't you? The answer is always yes. If you feel to yourself, I'm kind of afraid he might do that, then prepare for it. And then this was nice. It was just your classic, the last few, your classic front cross to the next obstacle, sorry. The last few trials, 
feels like all of them. The, the uh, next on course obstacle after the weave poles has been um, behind. So you don't get to run past. So let that be a training lesson to you. Um, Amy, <laughs> don't just keep, teach your dog to stay in the poles as you're running past because um, folks are having troubles with this and I'm one of them. Uh, you get to train in all kinds of crazy weave stuff and you're all over the place. And then what, and then one day you have to be kind of close and, and do what should be easy and the dog um, has trouble. So, and you'll see in the video, I stay within the space of my jump here. So you guys, everybody knows what the refusal line is on an obstacle, right? I hope. I also do the space of the jump. So if I'm doing a pull cue, I don't leave the space of the jump and you'll see me rotate there to get the dog to do that. And then I was real careful to not T-bone that triple. So I ran, I need my dog to go like that. So I ran like that. I ended up over here. Questions? I think one of the more fun parts of this course was where to lead out to, how far to lead out in order to do what you wanted to do on four and show the right amount of uh, motion there. Sometimes something like this looks really simple and folks don't think about how much time it, you know, what the dog is going to see as he exits the tunnel, you know, if you're over here and just even acknowledging that the dog can go do that by themselves. If you can run a little bit here, how many steps do you have to take for the dog knows it's the tunnel? Do you need to pass this to or not? Let's watch it. Um, Oh, here we go again with this. We'll watch it once at regular speed. I showed you some, you guys something in slow-mo a couple of weeks ago that I don't know if we ever watched it in. So we'll watch it in regular speed. Maybe we'll watch it in regular speed a couple times. That's the dog ahead of me. And then we'll slow mo a few things down. So that's a moving release. I do those quite often if anybody has questions about that. So he's going to look at that wrong end of the tunnel. Almost went in it. I'm setting that line hard and got, and I paralleled that path pretty nice. And now I'm in the middle of that white jump where I did that pull cue. Very nice. So we'll just um, watch it one more time and then I'll do a little bit of slow mo stuff. I actually was closer to that four than I told you that I was. And I wanted to show him movement that I wasn't giving him a cue to do the second jump of the 180. And that was because I was rear crossing the first jump. That's one lane. Very nice.
So the tires one, this jump is two, the tunnels three, this jump is four. And I told you that I was about here. And um, I can see now that I went a little bit closer to four, but you can see um, this is five, right? I hope you can see my cursor. And this is six, the panel. So a lot of... Oh, Sherry, your little iPhone's talking to us. Um, yes, self-destructed. <laughs> oh, yeah, see if you can, see if you can mute you. Um, so folks were afraid if they rear cross the, I suspect that if they rear cross this jump that their dog wouldn't carry out to that jump. And that's why you need um, to be able to do what I call shallow rear crosses. In order to do a shallow rear cross, I would have had to, I was closer to this jump. So if I had been, if I had sent Tux to this jump and been up here and rear cross this jump, it would have, by nature of where I would have had to have run, it would have turned into a rear cross pull. So the space with me here, I could soften my line and let him have more of a, an assemblance of um, a softer turn. And I'm, and I'm really moving. And now I'm gonna drop anchor. My goal is to have my onside foot setting the line and I'm looking at him. So you can see that I've got my foot. I'm not gonna stand facing the tunnel yelling. You guys, that's, that's a big pet peeve of mine when folks are facing the dog to get their attention and not getting the line set. So I am calling and I am looking at him. I don't know if you can see that. And I want to be in D cell before he arrives, which I am. And I would call that front cross a bit late. And you'll see that I'm not zigzagging. The course zigzags. And I'm telling him, go on, I'm buying. So you can tell that he has no doubt to take that jump in extension. You guys, if he hadn't taken that jump in extension, he might've curled back and I might've gotten a refusal on this jump. But you can tell how he takes this jump that I am now purchasing this jump by telling him to go on, go on, go on, go on. I'm just saying, go take the logical thing. Go, 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 go. Um, don't mind me. And the reason, and again, and I'm pretty far behind, and I think you heard that's another reason why I played it twice. So now this rear cross is buying that jump, is buying that turn, sorry, and the go ons. But I've hardly rotated. My shoulders are over in a good way, my shoulders are over my hips. And now I want to have that line set before he lands. And I would call, we could argue about that, but I'm not going to be any earlier when I'm that far behind because your position influences your dog. Timing influences your dog, lane and line. And, and I may have had to converge on that dog walk, what I was talking about, because this jump looks awful close. So um, I am coming in there, which helps me understand him uh, looking at the far end of the tunnel, because that is what I would do if I wanted the far end. And I'm still paralleling his path. Ooh, yeah, I'm just going to have you guys come on Wednesday night and I'll just analyze myself. So now it begs the question, what question is begged here? Anybody? I'm going to get a drink of water so you have time to unmute and answer me. I can't see the chat when I'm screen sharing, so I can't say chat. Anybody? I'm paralleling the path to the off course tunnel. It begs the question. Throttle. It begs the question if I if I needed to cue a threadle. I am working on a verbal, it's not the end you think, which is his name. 
because I can't remember any more words. So you can tell how close he almost went in. And I think we'll watch this part in regular. So you guys, I got second place on this in this class and um, I missed first by a second to a student. I, if I'm gonna be beat, I wanna be beat by a student and uh, Tracy's got slider and they're pretty hot stuff. So, and, and she beats me often, so don't, so I'm not saying it was a fluke, but I do some things where I throw time away um, and again, I, I mean, I am sure hoping because I, Tracy, you know what? <laughs> you guys know Tracy and Slider. Her record stands for herself. I don't have to defend her ability at all. She's a rock star. Um, so um, I do say good boy when the judge says go, because I'm just paranoid about my table performance. So when the judge says go, I could release him quickly. And that would be the competitive thing to do. There is no table in the national levels or at world levels because of the human, the human count being involved. So um, I don't mind throwing that time away. Good boy. So let's just see if you can hear that. Uh, ooh. Good boy break, as if it's one word. And uh, 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 my front cross is starting before he's done weaving. And I've got him uh, in the exact path. We could maybe call that light, but because I have a pop out issue, I do not do my front crosses early. And here's the big tip, you guys. This is something every single one of you can do tomorrow when you train. When you do a pull cue, stay in the space of the jump. Don't, don't run out to that red jump. Just rotate in place. He's going to see the red jump because if you, if you go running, I'm pointing, if you go running that way, you're changing the line. Now I've got the line set for the triple as well. And that's a double to a triple at the end of the course. And you can see I'm not running towards the triple, which tons of people do, Tell, which if I did, if I ran this way, I would be queuing. I would want to be, I would be intentionally cueing the backside of the triple. We never, ever, ever take backsides of triples, but dogs don't know that. So I'm paralleling his path whenever possible. Sandy, when you do the pole cue, do you differentiate whether you stand in front of Stanton versus stand in front of the bars? I mean, as far as do you do you plot exactly depending upon the course exactly yeah. where you stand? Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, you know, I joke a blade of grass. Yeah, for sure. I, I usually say first third, middle third, or last third of the bar, and then um, whether or not the wing is exposed or not. But yeah, it depends on how far away this jump is. So that's why I'm so, so how do you make that decision into which third you want to be in? How tight, the, the position of the next obstacle. Okay. And the, so that's a, I can go a step further with that. You guys, I work all my dogs. In fact, I like distance work. It's my passion. So this, so I consider a lane roughly, and I do not have, you know, don't get me on something new here, but um, so I consider a lane about a dog's body width. So what am I about seven lanes over? And it might be it might be wider. Um, some people run closer to the jump. So if you are if you have a Velcro dog, they call it, then you're you might be where my cursor is for this pull cue. 
you may be outside of the space of the jump. But this, this spacing between Tux and I right now is our most comfortable spacing. That's, that's weird. That's a logical jump. You can tell my hand isn't up. I'm not saying you stay out there for, you know, a baby novice Chihuahua dog, you know, that might be gamble distance work. So I have, I know if I'm crowding, I know if I'm working closer than we love. And I know if I'm working further than we love. And I know, well, Tux, I could, I just heard Tuck say, speak for yourself. <laughs> and my positional cues are slightly different based on if I'm doing, you know, different, uh, just like I was saying, I was driving him with a go on when I was so far behind on that line. Um, thoughts, questions, concerns, geometry. I was shocked. I didn't see a single person go the way that I went on the, if we go back to the, um, if we go back to Elmo for a second and, and I, and I've got a cute kind of a, a, I was still like, like I said, you guys, sometimes I don't go the way the majority goes, but I usually there's 20% that are going um, give me just a second there. So this is what I'm talking about. These two jumps right here. And, and, and I'm talking, I went this way and I didn't see anybody else go this way. When I came out of the ring, um, Tracy Duncan was there with her turf. And she laughed and said, I wondered if anybody was going to go that way. And then she said, you know, darn you, you just, you know, and she said, I could see that it was a much better, a much better line for the rest of it, but it was harder to handle. And, and um, I am at a point in my career, you guys, where, and I'm getting a lot more respect for folks that don't think like I do, but I, my challenge is the course um, and I want to handle it as I think it was designed to be handled more than I want the cue. I really do. I really, there, it would have been safer and easier to go the, the non-best line for the dog. So that's personal, man. It's a lot of money to show. It's a lot of money and um, time. And if you like collecting, um, you know, I like collecting cues, don't get me wrong. I'd rather qualify than not, but it's too bad we don't have my last run of this weekend where I went just screwed up left and right, but it was a clean run, but I, I wasn't as proud. Um, I wasn't as proud at all. I, I got lost. I was on the wrong side of the course. I was literally screaming by the end of the course, not no words. So don't get me wrong. I'm not a prima donna. I ain't too proud to beg and I ain't too proud to fight for, for something. But when I'm making my plan, I want to, um, I, I, uh, I, I guess I'd just rather go down in flames trying to do it the way I think it's supposed to be done. Questions about that, about this course, about the decision making, anything? We've got we've got 10 full minutes. We could um, chop off anything about we could, you know, if there's a different part of the course you want to discuss. Rear crosses, 180s. Somebody I have asked a question her. about your lead out. Mm -hmm. It isn't clear to me what your signal to Tux was. To, to move it was verbal okay it was a it was a moving um lead out which i do lots i do tons of proofing of it in training but um i had my eyes on the path and it was a real clear distinct uh right is his release word okay and that's what i used to okay thank you mm -hmm. There's usually an advantage 
on the course to be stopped or be moving. So again, that's back to um, hoping that my training will allow me freedoms. Anybody else? Um, I, I'm in the midst of training some running contacts. So doing that dog walk, I would definitely, like you said, do the threadle. But would you not try to desell a bit in that case, right? We, rather than pushing and driving to the end of the dog walk? Well, if you're, you mean decel to help the dog get the contact or decel to create the turn cue? To create the turn cue into the tunnel. No, uh, no, I was in decel with Tux. Um, right. But, but if you're having a running, you're not going to be ahead much. No, no, you're not. So you'll have to have, you'll have to have the professionals. The, you know, the, yeah. the running folks have to have, and, the, and that's just going to keep growing the uh, extraordinary directionals and distance because, you know, if, if you, yeah. where I my right, if I'd have been running, I mean, I was up far enough. Um, I rotate on my threadle cue. <clears throat> so D cell always plays its part. And that's why I said it begs question um yeah. the way the a-frame was positioned mm -hmm. Mary made it so d, d cell could yeah. turn them there a little bit but yes if i rotated on my threadle i would have definitely had d cell yeah but you won't be able okay. to sell with a running to help you with yeah. that hope that okay. answers your question Good. Comments? Anybody that ran it have a comment? Some place you like, some place you didn't. This may be more than you want to get into at this point, Sandy, but the last time you saw us compete, and you just mentioned it briefly, is about arm up on a line versus arm down in a running position. Yeah. Is we were on a pretty wide open, straightforward, gently arcing line. And yeah. I had my arm down running. And yeah. you were surprised I didn't have my arm out supporting that line. But to me, it seemed very straightforward. And same thing with yours. I say thing I would never have considered having my arm up like where you were saying your arm was down. Do you yep. want to discuss that for a minute? Because I was still confused and I know we were going to talk about it, which is again, maybe this is not appropriate to do it right now, but I was surprised that you said I should have had my arm up instead of my arm down and just charging straight ahead. Yes, you were. <laughs> you were surprised. Yes, um, I was. Yeah. You know, I thought a lot about that and wished we had it on video. And um, it, I think that it was an arc out on the corner of an of a um, of a course. And you know, I wished I could see it again to say what my, what my gut. And I simply may have underestimated your natural spacing with her. You know, I simply you may have developed a much uh, wider lane space than I would be expecting from you or her, or, you know, a young dog, or it just may have been the, if it was the edge of the course. Um, and, you know, I could have been wrong. Oh, oh, no, Sandy. Don't know, Sandy. That's a five letter word. No bad Sandy. <laughs> Um, you were so surprised when I said it that I thought, oh, they're doing a lot of running where, you know, that is a natural spacing. And I think I just assumed that it wasn't, that it was a little further out than your norm. You know, when we, when we train on the video, Gwen, I have a terrible perspective. You know, when I coach you via video, 
I mean, it's hard because how do you do 3D training on a 2D view? I mean, it makes it very difficult because of the 2D aspect to it. Speed. I can see your timing of your crosses. There's some value, but that could be a place where um, I think you're closer than you are. But um, I didn't, it wasn't, my comment wasn't because I thought it did her a disservice. I just thought for whatever reason, um, and if it was a if it was a slight arc on the edge of a course, or there was something she could have come into that would have been just a help helping hand. You guys, sometimes there isn't a straight, like especially arm up, arm down, casual indicator, and that's another. You know, a lot of times I'll just have my arm, it's up. Like here, here's the example. So my arm is up. This is this is just you know casual you're not coming in and then this is you know i i'm concerned that you're going to think you should come in and i'm advertising so that could have also been a difference um gwen between this handling and just having a little bit more confirmation versus um just running which is, I remember you were just running and I, I, re, I remember thinking she should, I think the, the dog would have, you guys, if you're some ceiling, here's the real thing. If you're sealing a deal, so you're in an okay lane and that if, and it isn't a problem and you're, you are just running and there is an argument for places of just pump your arms and go. I mean, I've said it to all of you that train with me a million times, just pump your arms and go. But that arm of stay out there, keep doing those, go, 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 can be a little tiny bit extra confirmation, green light, you're on the right track, and it could speed the dog up a bit. So it was more of a feeling, Gwen, than a concrete, oh my gosh, you're so wrong to not have your arm up there. I'm glad you forgot about it, though. Of course, I forgot about it. I always forget about all of your comments. You forget some of the good ones sometimes. <laughs> I would never do that. <laughs> Anybody else? Thank you. you bet. You bet. I thought about it too. Wish we had it on video. Um, going once. Going twice. 